lot. So we should all be back. Um, again, if you guys can, please open up the cameras. Um, what I'll do real quick, though, just provide you a brief background of who we were reading. Um, and Gubi Wath Yango. Uh, one second. Okay, um, one, just kind of to point out real quick, he is teaching currently, I believe currently, um, at the University of Ur California, Irvine. So he's not too far removed from you and I, a um, little trip down south, um, and, and we'll be able to kind of touch base with him if you so choose. Um, again, another thing to point out, you know, especially when you think about thinkers like Karanga, think about thinkers like Ngugi, um, with them being accessible, it's always, you know, wise to try to reach out to them if you have a question about their work and things of that nature. Um, he was born in Kenya um, to, in 1938, a large peasant family. He was educated at the Kamadura Mangu, a Kikuyu Primary School Alliance High School, all in Kenya, um, the Makerere University College, um, then the campus of London University. Um, Kampala, Uganda, and the University of Leeds in Britain. So again, one of those, one of these scholars who uh, primary education took place in colonized um, territories and then traveled abroad to get um, European education. Um, so this is Ngugi Wa Thiango. Um, the text is Decolonizing the Mind. So the portion that we read deals specifically with language, right? Um, some general thoughts. What did you guys think about the reading? You guys enjoy it? You struggled with it? Uh, you got what he was up to? What you, would you think about the reading? I really liked the reading. Okay. Um, I liked his uh, point of view when he said that like this reading was his farewell to English as a delivery medium because like throughout like in the beginning, I was a little confused about what he meant by that. But by the end of it, I understood what he meant and his purpose of doing that. Yeah, um, thank you, Angelica. That's actually how I was going to start off. Um, the things that I found of interest as well. Um, this is a farewell to the English language as his theoretical, theoret theoretical production medium, right? So he'll no longer use language to produce his text. Um, how many of you guys are, are um, bilingual in the course? So uh, for my bilingual speak, uh, speakers, um, think about the effect that, or the affect that the reading had on you. And, and I wanna discuss that a little bit in our, um, our group discussion, okay? Um, so another thing that stood out to me outside of, of what Angelica mentions in the sense of his farewell to the English language, right? Um, this book is part of a continuing debate all over, the continent of Africa about Africa's destiny, right? But for him, he centers this debate around this conversation of language, right? So he says, this is something that's reflective of conversation that's going on all throughout Africa as they try to identify and articulate what the destiny of Africa will look like, okay? He gives us on page, um, I wanna say page two, I'm sorry, page three actually, this notion of US imperialism, right? And he, and he gives us this notion of the ultimatum presented by US imperialism. And the ultimatum is either theft or death, right? Those are the two options that he, he, he presents to you. Um, this for me made me think about a, a book, I wanna say it came out in the early 2000s and it's entitled, and I forget the author of the book, but it's titled The Diary of an Economic Hitman. Right. And essentially all the author describes is him going to all of these so-called third world countries, um, speaking to the leaders of these so-called countries and telling them this, either you sign your oil contracts over to the United States government or we'll come back and have a coup d'etat and we'll assassinate you. What do you want to do? Right. So this is what Ngugi is talking about. The ultimatum of theft will steal your, your resources or death, right? So think about how we talked about last week, this idea of colonialism. So this, this, this idea comes back up within the work of Thiango. Um, 
So the cultural bomb, right? And, and you guys talked about that a little bit in your breakout groups. I'm gonna read um, the paragraph with the cultural bomb just to kind of provide more context. The oppressed and the exploited of the earth maintain their defiance. Liberty from death, sorry, liberty from theft. This is on page three. Um, but the biggest weapon wielded and actually daily unleashed by imperialism against the, that collective defiance is the cultural bomb, okay? So it says this is the biggest threat unleashed against these cultures who try to assert their defiance against colonialism, okay? So the biggest threat that the powers of colonialism have is the cultural bomb, okay? Um, the effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, their language, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. I'm gonna read that one more time. The effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their language, in their environment, in their heritage of struggle, in their unity, in their capacities, and ultimately in themselves. So that's what the cultural bomb does, okay? It makes them see their past as one wasteland of non-achievement. And it makes them want to distance themselves from that wasteland. It makes them want to identify with that which is furthest removed from themselves. For instance, with other people's languages rather than their own, right? And so when Ngugi is picking up is how this cultural bomb affects how people relate to their language, right? Um, in the African context, right? From those who come from the African diaspora, how this plays out, you don't want to attach yourself to anything to do with Africa, right? Um, I don't know if y'all seen the Boys in the Hood Hello Old movie, but when my there's a scene in the Boys in the Hood where he tells them that everyone comes from Africa, right? And he's like, nah, I know from I'm not from Africa, you African booty scratcher, right? So growing up, that was like the term, anything you brought up Africa, that was how you would refer to, right? So again, this distancing yourself from your homeland. This is the effect of the cultural bomb, right? So instead of looking at the richness of African culture you choose to try to clown or again, distance yourself from it, right? Um, it's a reason why every time in the West, we see images of Africa, it's images of people in huts, people who aren't hung are hungry and starving, right? This is purposeful. This is not the only thing that goes on in Africa, right? There are cities in Africa that are honestly more beautiful than LA, like honestly. Right? There's beaches in Africa that will shit on Santa Monica and Malibu, like honestly, right? So, but we are not given these depictions of Africa because they want you to distance yourself from your native place, right? The same could be true for the indigenous communities, right? Um, because through the missionary schools, through the institution of colonialization, right? You're taught to devalue your indigenous language, right? Spanish is the ideal language or English is the even more ideal language, right? Um, certain ways of dress, certain customs, those begin to get devalued because you want to ascribe to more European values and more European customs, right? The same cultural bomb takes effect in those communities as well, right? In the Asian communities, the phenomenon of Asian women trying to make their eyes look more rounded opposed to being their natural slanted look, right? That's a cultural bomb, or an effect of colonialism, right? So this is what Ngugi is talking about when he mentions this cultural bomb. Um, this is important also. Um, this is on page four. This is where he actually starts off the um, essay when he's talking about language, right? So prior to this, we're dealing with the introduction. And I'm going to read this is the very last a um, couple of sentences at the, in the opening paragraph, starting with the choice. The choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to a people's definition of themselves in relation to their natural and social environment. Indeed, in relation to the entire universe, right? 
So again, how uh, people chooses to use their language is gonna determine how they react to society, how they're gonna react to the universe, right? This is what he's asserting. Hence, language has always been at the heart of the two contending social forces in the, Af in the Africa of the 20th century. So he's saying, so think back to um, last week's reading in So May, right? And he talks about, I, I said, what is the tension at play in the reading, right? He talks about these two opposing worlds in the reading that we had last week. We're having the same tension played out here. But for Ngugi, he's talking about it from the context of language, right? But he says, hence, language has always been at the heart of the two contending social forces in the Africa of the 20th century. So, um, is he going? Let me see. One second. So, in the book, he mentions how colonial nations in Africa are identified by their language, right? So, if you speak um, Portuguese, then that's a signifier that you are a Portuguese colonial co colony. Excuse me. If you speak French. That's a signal that you're a, a colony that's colonized by France. You speak English, that's a symbol, a signifier that you're an English um, colony, right? So that has evolved into the point to where there's de definitions such as francophone, right? So um, Glissant is a francophone thinker. What was the language that that book was originally written in? The open boat, what was the original language of the open boat? You guys don't remember the translated text? With a French? French, absolutely. So Glissant is francophone, which means he's a, a French speaking thinker, right? So again, what Ngugi is saying, how your language begins to identify you, right? Um, Kukuyu was a British colony, right? So Ngugi was an Anglophone. He spoke English. Hence, this is the last book, this is the last time that he'll be writing in English, right? So again, Anglophone identifies a, a thinkers that are colonized who speak English. Francophones is a term that's developed to identify thinkers who've been colonized who speak French. French, excuse me. Going back to Ngugi's point of your language signifies you, right? The choice of language and the use to which language is put is essential, uh, central to a people's definition of themselves, right? So what he's saying. So now we get to this conference, right? Um, the Conference of African Writers of the English, uh, what was it, the English Expression. And the problem that Ngugi has with this conference so I'll, I'll read the opening. This is the uh, page six, top of page six, the opening paragraph. The title, A Conference of African Writers of English Expression, automatically excluded those who wrote in African languages. Now on, looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986, I can see this contained absurd abnormalities. Now, uh, this is important, right? Because he says, looking back from the self-reflecting heights of 1986, what do you think that means? So one, we know he's looking back, right? And he's self-reflecting. He, he tells us that plainly, right? But he's doing this from the vantage point of 1986. What's the significance of that? Ever, ever heard the term hindsight's 2020? No? So what's 2020 vision? Perfect vision. Perfect vision, right? So if you're looking back, you're gonna see with perfect vision. So can you, so for example, you could tell me everything that happened to you yesterday, right? Cause that shit already happened to you. So there's no surprise. There's nothing that's in your blind spot cause you know, cause you've seen it play out, right? So what Ngugi is saying, now in 1986, looking back to this conference that took place in the 70s, I see the, the, the misstep, I see the mistake, right? Because hindsight is 2020. 
when looking back to the past, you see everything clearer, but you often miss some certain things in the moment, right? So he says, the self-questioning heights of 1986. I can see this contained absurd abnormalities. I, a student, could qualify for the meeting on the basis of only two published short stories, The Fig Tree in a student journal and The Return in the new journal. Okay, so he's saying as a student, I could attend this conference and I only published two texts, okay? Um, but neither Saban Robert, then the greatest living East African poet with several works of poetry and prose to his credit in Kiswahili, nor Chief Fagnua, the greatest Nigerian writer with several published titles in Yoruba could possibly qualify, okay? So this is the equivalent of Angelica, you have two essays published in a journal, right? A student journal. So because of those two publications being written in English, you're able to attend this conference, right? I'm the greatest poet in the world. I'm a professor. I have books, several books published, right? I'm recognized again as the greatest poet in the world. But I can't attend that conference because when I do my poetry, I do my poetry in Tedenya, right? It's, which is an African language. So, but mind you, this conference is about African writers. You see the contradiction there. So the only African writers that will be recognized are writers who produce text in English, right? Hence the title of the conference, Conference for African Writers of the English Expression, Anglophone Expression, right? So this is the problem that he has um, with the conference. Um, let's see. You know what? Yeah, actually, we'll, I'll read this last one. And, and um, my last point of emphasis on page nine, um, second full paragraph. The paragraph starts with how. Mm, I got, actually, I got one more after this. Um, so how did we arrive at this acceptance of the fatalistic logic? What does fatalistic logic mean? What do you guys think that means? Fatalistic logic. I do not know. Yeah, talk to me. Or I said, I do not know. <laughs> do not know, okay. Um, what does it mean, fatal? What does fatal mean? Like deadly? Deadly, okay. So think about, so fatalistic is just a, a derivative of fatal, right? So how do we arrive at this deadly logic, essentially is what he's saying. So how do we arrive at the acceptance of this fatalistic logic, of this deadly logic, of the insaliable position of English in our literature. Unsaliable means it cannot be conquered, right? This is the, the, the position English is unsaliable, so you cannot overcome it, right? The top foremost position of English in, in our literature, right? So when he's talking about our literature, he's talking about African literature, in our culture, in our politics. What was the route from the Berlin of 1884? Does anybody know what the significance of Berlin in 1884 was? Anybody heard of the Berlin Conference? So the Berlin Conference of 1884 is when all of the European powers, um, France, Britain, uh, Belgium, all of the vast European powers, they come together, they conference in, the, in, in Belgium in the year 1884, and they decide who gets Africa, who gets what portion of Africa, right? So the French says, I'm going to take Senegal, um, I'm going to take these French-speaking colonies, those will be mine, right? The British say, I'll take Kenya, I'll take these certain English-speaking colonies, they'll be mine. The Belgium said, I'll take the Congo, and all these um, British, uh, Belgian-speaking um, colonies will be mine, right? The Portuguese said, I'll take these, um, colonies. So it's the how Africa was divided up, right? So mind you, in this conference, no Africans attended this conference. So this would be the equivalent of um, 
people, all of the people in power in Beverly Hills coming together, meeting in Beverly Hills and deciding how they would divide up East LA, right? And regardless to how the people in LA, East LA think or feel about their living situation, right? And that's the instant, that's how, or that's the constitution that placed colonialism into being, right? This conference in Belgium in 1884. So he's questioning, how do we get to this understanding, this fatalistic understanding that English is the optimum language that we can produce our own African literature, right? This is the question. What was the root from the Berlin Conference of 1884 via the Marquis? So now the Marquis, the Marquereri, that's his university, right? That's where he got trained at in Kenya. But mind you, think about last week's reading, right? Maladoma Somme had to go to the universities, the white man's universities to learn his way of life, right? This is what, same thing that Ngui's talking about. That Marquerri, that's the, the white man's university that's placed through colonialism in Africa, okay? So we go from the Berlin Conference to the colonial universities of 1962 to what is still the prevailing and dominant logic a hundred years later. How did we as African writers come to be so feeble towards the claim of our language on us and so aggressive of our claims uh, on other languages, particularly the languages of our colonialization, right? So we're feeble when it comes to defending African languages, right? We're feeble when it comes to defending our indigenous languages, right? But we're bold and we're aggressive when it comes to defending the languages that colonized us, right? And this is what Ngugi is questioning. This is the problem in Ngugi's text, right? How do we get to this point? Um, I'm going to end there, but the last thing I'll say, what Ngugi presents to us is a problematic, right? Which is separate from a problem. Yes, obviously there's a problem, right? The problem is language. But he, he it's a little bit different because he presents various components of that problem, right? How does this problem language impact the way African thinkers produce literature, right? That's part of this notion called the problematic, right? He's not only presenting the problem, but he's looking at all aspects of the problem. So this is this notion of a problematic that Ngugi is presenting us with. Um, who would like to, anyone wants to volunteer for our fishbowl today? Question? I actually have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Claudia. Um, what does that, um, the, what you explain right now with language, what does it have to do with dialects? Is that anything, because in Africa, like there's so many dialects and every tribe um, has so many languages, like the most diverse country. Um, so does that, is that speaking directly about like different dialects in different ways or is that off? Um, that's a brilliant question. Yes, you're, I want to say over 1400 languages and dialects in Africa. Um, but where Ngugi is more attentive to is the colonial imposition, right? So yes, there's various different dialects, right? Igo, Igbo and, and Hausa are two separate di dialects that for people who are neighboring in Nigeria, right? That's really not a concern of Ngugi. And Gooby's more concerned with how the British came in and made people who speak Igbo and Hausa speak English, right? And, and why is it that people who speak Igbo and speak Hausa don't want to speak Igbo or speak Hausa or are ashamed or embarrassed of their Igbo or their Hausa and they want to claim, cling to English, right? So while it's a brilliant question, you're absolutely right, but and Googie is more concerned with that colonial imposition. And I even want to say he, he mentions the differences in the text somewhere, kind of early on in the text. Um, does that answer your question though? Kind of, yeah. Kind of. So, so, so let's, let's get a full answer. What, what, um, what seems still unclear or, or what's not filled in for you? Well, I'm just basing it off of like my knowledge. Um, like for me, um, I speak Spanish, but mm -hmm. the like um, Spaniards colonized Mexico, and of course that that changed our language. But my Spanish isn't so it's similar to Spanish Spanish, like Spain from Spain, okay. but it's not directly that same. Like we don't use vos or we don't have that that 
type of accent that they have, as well as like from Central America or Brazil or other countries that are Spanish speaking, but they don't have the same type of words that we use, if that makes any sense. Like, yeah. so, like our words just translate differently sometimes, but we still speak Spanish. So what you're saying is like, how would Ngugi situate like the adjustments made to the colonial language? So yes, it's Spanish, but my Spanish is slightly different from the Spanish that they're speaking in Spain, right? So it's not exactly that colonial language, correct? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like, that's where the, the dialect comes in. Okay. So so to me, that question is more situated in Glisson, right, Claudia? Because he's interested in how uh, imposition from um, operatives of power, how do people subvert them and create something new? Right, and, and what you're expressing is that, that's that creolization that Glissant is talking about, how you took that Spanish from Spain, from Portugal, and you created a, a separate dialect to it, right? Um, that's the equivalent to what they may call Ebonics, right? Like black folks taking the standard English vernacular and flipping it, right? Um, so so I, I get that. I don't know, um, I don't know if Ngugi addresses that in particular. Um, I would say you would find your answer more in that in, in the work of Gleason. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, Fishbowl, does anybody want to volunteer to Fishbowl? Actually, real quick, before I do that. Um, so um, I, as far as Claudia's question, I want to point out, um, that's examples of two frameworks of question, right? question for deeper understanding, but that's also a question that could start research, right? So she could produce a whole research paper off that question that she just posed to me right now, right? So I just want you guys to be attentive to what I say, what, what I mean when I say um, questions that spark research. That's the perfect example of it right now, because I, I guarantee you if Claudia were to think about that a little bit more and start researching that, that's a research paper. So I just want to not let that moment pass without showing you an example of questions that spark research. Um, Fishbowl, who is there? Anybody want to volunteer? Uh, I'll go. Okay, Victor. Uh, I could go. Uh, Mark. Anybody else? All right, so I'll call that random. Um, just one more. Uh, Gabriella, are you prepared to fishbowl? And remember, you could talk about what we discussed in the breakout group, what I discussed in the lecture. Um, you also have one time to pass. Oh, uh, yeah, I can go. You go? All right. All right, so we have Victor, Mark, and Gabriella. Um, whoever wants to set it off, it's on you. I guess I'll go. Um... So reading this, I got really confused in the introduction part, but as I read the second portion of it, I was able to start to understand more of it. Um, I do like though how he mentioned that a lot of people refer to Africa having its problems, but they're like internal problems. So like they blame like, I don't know, like disputes between tribes and like politicians and all that. But how he says the reality is, is that colonialism is still the root problem of all these problems in Africa. Yeah. And I don't know, it just, it made me realize things because in like movies and documentaries of interviews with people from Africa and all that, they don't talk about that. They always just show like, oh, well this politician because of his, because his, he is in control of it. Like he doesn't allow certain things and it makes the country or the communities like, you know, the, it limits what they can and can't do. Uh, uh, big, uh, I'm not just gonna go, go ahead, are you finished? No, yeah, yeah, I'm finished. Okay, uh, very good point, man. Uh, I do want to ask you, could you draw a comparison to a situation going on in our world today to where um, we see that the conflict is, we call it blaming on the people, but you don't look at the structural issues at play, right? Can you think of an example of that? Or anybody in the class, think of an example to where the people involved in the conflict are blamed for the conflict, conflict but the government or the structures that created the conflict are never looked at or blamed. Uh, 
the only one I could think of would just be the riots and protests from last summer. I mean, it's a great example. It's a great example. Absolutely. Because so if with that example, right, if the police would not be killing folks unjustly, there would be no need to riot, right? There'll be no need to protest, right? There would be no need to, to be in the streets doing those things, right? Um, a few other examples. Um, drug dealing, right? Drug trafficking is another example of that. And gangs. Why would I say drug trafficking and gangs? I would say because um, uh, lower income communities are like pushed to those type of things because of the systems that are in place that oppress people of color. Absolutely. Does that make sense to everybody though? Right? So if there were no poverty, you would not need to sell drugs, right? It's simple. If the police protect and serve everyone, there would be no need for gangs, right? So again, these are structural issues where the subjects, the people involved, get blamed for them, right? Poverty, welfare. Somebody's gonna say something? Yeah, I was going to say, would another example be when inmates come out of jail and they can't find a job directly, so they go back to crime and then they go back to jail? Absolutely. That's a, that's a premier example. Absolutely. Right. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to cut the, I just broke into the fishbowl, but I think that was an important point to make. Thank you, Victor. Um, Marco Gabriella? Uh, I'll go. Uh, one of the things I found, it was like in the third paragraph. Uh, page six, like in the beginning, he like he asked like a lot of questions, like is this does this qualify for like African literature? And it, when written, like when between languages and like what language to write, um, like when he when he said like does it qualify to be in uh to be in African literature is because like who who primarily who wrote it, like if the African obviously if African descent wrote. It, uh, a literature based on his own culture, then it will be considered uh, like an African literature. But in his, because he he's from that um, culture. But if someone else wrote it, then like the ethos, you know, will be like um, will be like questionable because like it was not is not his own um, culture or language. Very good point. And there's different stand different point of views of people so like if an english uh, uh, if an, a european like wrote a text in african in african literature um he's most likely going to favor like the european side more than the african side good point Gabrielle, you ready? Yeah, um, just to branch off of what Victor was saying, how like um, colonialism like is the root of majority of our problems today. And um, sorry, I forgot what I was gonna say. It's all good. Oh, um, also how like they portray Africa as just like a land of poverty and stuff. And it's just ironic how like the reason it is the way it is in like many of these places is because of colonialization. And then also um, the concept of culture bombing, I would just, isn't that like assimilation basically? Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the effects of the cultural bomb, right? Because you don't think that your culture is valuable enough. So you want to assimilate into the dominant culture, right? Um, also you see that play out in the whole conversation around desegregation in the United States, right, in the early um, 60s and 50s, right? And I know this shit is gonna sound crazy to hear, but like, is it, hear me out, right? I think one of the greatest missteps that black folks made as a movement, or one of the greatest missteps of the civil rights movement was to solely focus the movement on desegregation. Can anybody think or respond to why I would say that? One of the biggest missteps of the civil rights movement was to solely focus on this push for desegregation or integration. Um, well, desegregation doesn't exactly mean 
like equality so even if like everything's like equal people are like being able to go to the same schools and all of that it doesn't really mean everybody's gonna be treated equally Absolutely. and it, that could be seen up to today when it's uh talking about police brutality so yeah absolutely has anybody heard of um black wall street you shaking your head angelica a little bit um anybody who's seen the watchman on hbo just trying to find a random way to work y'all through this okay so if not um there is a town in oklahoma called tulsa right that's where my, my grandmother's from um in the 19 between 1915 to 1920 right this area ashwood and pine and greenwood um it's like the surrounding blocks of this area of tulsa oklahoma amassed enough wealth that they were considering trading with outside countries right so doing their um farming with france was something they were considering the state of oklahoma had two airports in the state, right? In Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, there were 11 private jets in 1915, okay? Just, just think about that shit, right? So the Ontario Mills, sorry, the Ontario Airport and LAX, right? Those are two of the several major airports in California, right? Within this one block, within this one community, there's 11 private jets, right? That's the amount of wealth that they had in this area. Own businesses, their own banks, their own schools, their own hospitals, their own doctors, right? Their own libraries, their own, everything was insulated. You didn't have to leave outside that community for anything, right? This is what they were able to build up in this nation, uh, in this, in this um, area called uh, Black Wall Street. Right. Again, so much wealth that they were thinking about trading with other countries. What do you think happened to Black Wall Street? Didn't they like burn it down? They bombed it. The first domestic bombing in U.S. history. So the first time U.S. citizens bombed U.S. territory was the bombing of Black Wall Street. Right. So when I talk about this notion of segregation being a, a desegregation, excuse me, being a misstep, that's what I mean, right? When we were separate, that is what we were able to do for ourselves, right? So what happens when segregation comes, all that economic ability that built up enough money to have 11 private jets in one community, all that money got filtered into other communities. Does that make sense? That's why I say that desegregation was the biggest misstep of the civil rights movement. If anything, to Angelica's point, it should be give us the equal opportunity to compete with y'all at, 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 at an equal level, right? You don't necessarily have to go to their restaurants to have equality. You don't have to go to their schools to have equality, right? Just give us the resources that allows us to compete at that level. Um, Thank you guys for the fishbowl. Some really valid points were brought up. Um, what I do want to talk about for the last um, time left, um, one, I want to get in the conversation for those who are bilingual. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and how the reading was impressed on you and the way that he kind of art articulates the tension between using your native language and using your um, the colonial language. And then also, um, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about positioning Spanish as a colonial language. Um, I believe it was Claudia brought up a very good point as it pertains to that, but but I, I'm curious to hear how, how the class do. So two conversations on the table for now, right? Um, for my bilingual speakers, what was your effective relationship with the reading? And then what does the class think about this idea of Spanish being a colonial, Spanish and English really being colonial languages? I'll say something. Uh, while reading, uh... While looking at this, um, on page seven, like in the middle, he the author brought up like a, a source when it says, "Is it right for a man should abandon his mother tongue for something for someone else's?" It looks like a dreadful betrayal and produces guilty feeling, like when he like 
brought the word like betrayal and a guilty feeling. Uh, I feel like he like opposes uh, being like bilingual, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm um, getting it right, but I feel like he opposes being bilingual. And what I was taught like within my own culture, it's good to be bilingual, especially like with this. Uh, especially right now, like more jobs are offered if you're bilingual and stuff like that. Um, okay, you're, 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 you're right. But what, what becomes important here when reading this is, is context, right? So one, he's talking about the importance for African writers to use African languages, right? So the issue is not really with per se being bilingual. Um, more so if it has an issue with being bilingual is the reason why I'm bilingual. Does that make sense? Right? Because I'm bilingual because of colonialism. If it wasn't for the colonial so experiences. Go ahead, go ahead, Mark, say it again. So not being bilingual by, by choice, but by like economic reasons or something like that. Yeah, I mean, by force, right? Like, yeah. Like, that, if we think about, I don't know if I gave in this class, I gave the example of colonialism of somebody coming into your house and taking over your refrigerator, taking over your toilet, right? Just taking your shit over. Um, along with that, they say, you're going to speak the language that I want you to speak, right? So that's part of this process of colonialization. So when Ngubi is saying, if we have a thing and we're calling ourselves writers, right? And we're African writers right? Why are we going to use the language of our oppressor to produce our literature? Why not use our own native tongue? So that's what he says, to portray your mother tongue is the betrayal, right? Because now you're not, you're not, and then too, think about this. Think about audience. If you're a, if you're a writer, one of your main concerns is who you're writing to and who you're speaking to, right? Um, so if you're not using your native tongue or your mother tongue, then that cuts off a vast majority of your audience who are your native people, right? So that's also where that portrayal comes, comes in at. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a, a disavow or a negative outlook to being bilingual. It's a negative outlook to being imposed a language, having a, a language imposed on you. And then, um, once that language has been imposed on you, you don't want to deal with your native language anymore, right? You only value that language that has dominated you for centuries. That's where the tension for Mbubi really, really rests. But that, that's a very good question because I, I think, how many of y'all was thinking like Mark? Was anybody else kind of felt the same way? And that's why I wanted to ask the bilingual speakers, how did you feel about this? Because I, I don't think you're the only one who thought about it that way. Um, anybody else? questions from bilingual speakers or this idea or notion that English and Spanish are colonial languages? I feel like in classrooms, at least for bilingual people, uh, growing up, I only spoke Spanish uh, when I was little, but going into pre-K, I was kind of yelled at by my sisters to learn English because they said I would get in trouble if I didn't speak English in classrooms. So I remember learning English through Sesame Street mm -hmm. and then going into pre-K. There wasn't the bilingual classrooms. I know that some places do have that, but here in Pasadena and Jefferson, there wasn't that. The only thing that they did was offer tutoring to learn English and to strengthen your English. So that's something that I did until I was like in third grade where I was proficient in English. So that, so when I was reading this, like I kind of saw like the similarities within like what I went through and then I compared it to like what he was saying. Yeah, um, did, and you may have been too young to think about this, but like did that, going through that process, did it make you look at Spanish speaking in any type of way? Like, did it give you a negative connotation to Spanish speaking? Definitely, yeah. Because like when I spoke it in public afterwards, well, I kind of felt ashamed to speak it because I was like, oh, this isn't the language they speak here. It's only a language that I should be speaking at home or with other people who do speak it. Yeah. And the only times I would speak it for a long time would be when I'm translating between English and Spanish. But now I'm more comfortable speaking like Spanish and English in public 
even though there's more of a stigma going around. And, and, and that's a cultural bomb, right? Like that that shame that you felt, right? Your sister re reprimanding you like, yo, don't speak that. Like that that's what he's talking about when he's speaking about these cultural bombs. Um, and, and really like, so I'm talking about this bilingualness in the, sp in the span of talking Spanish and English, but for the black folks, right? We bilingual too, right? Like how we talk in the barbershop ain't how you talk at work, right? And that's a, that's a form of being bilingual. And that's also a byproduct of the cultural bomb, right? Um, so you, that's the, that's the whole notion of code switching. Right? Have, has anybody heard or are familiar with the term code switching? Yeah. All right. So y'all understand anybody not know what code switching is. All right. Bet. So, um, I'm, I'm curious though, anybody else, what's your thoughts on this, um, reading as being bilingual, um, Ebonics, regular English, uh, Spanish, English. I, um, sorry. Okay. I'm actually, um, I learned English at when I was nine. So I had a harder time to learn it because of course I was I was in fourth grade. So everyone else already knew how to read. And I um I came from Mexico at that time. So I was um I just kind of sat in the classroom. I understood it. I I just wasn't really fluent in reading and writing. So everyone would just kind of look at me like if I was weird. But I actually took a different take to it. Um I felt bad I didn't really want to learn English anymore because I, my, my thinking at that time was like, I know Spanish and you guys don't. So it's kind of like, they would criticize me for not being able to write or like my teacher would pull me aside and always be like, you're, this is horrible. Or like, she would like pick on me for not being able to do the homework or that I took longer. And one time she even pulled me aside and said that she got so frustrated with me and I gave her my assignment. She's like, for your level, you're, it's fine. And she just kind of always targeted me for it. So I kind of took it in the negative sense. And I just, sometimes I would just, oh, my mom would always tell me like, uh, just, just because you don't know English doesn't mean you're not smart. It just means that you're smarter in a different way or you know something that they don't because she would always say, if they ever bug you, just tell them to try to speak Spanish and they won't be able to. So it's just, that kind of gave me um, a different way to view at it because I did struggle a lot. And I had like a third grade li reading level in like eighth grade. I didn't, I wasn't, it was really hard to get there because everyone else was advancing so fast and I was still really behind. So it could, it took me a long time, but when I did get it and I like started um, being able to like be as the other kids that that feeling went away because I was I was fine at that time yeah that's a lot um lot to unpack in what you said Claudia um but one of the first things that leaped out to me was your your position when you were um if you had fourth grade was kind of like in Googie right like I had this language it's a rich language it's a beautiful language it's my native language why why do I have to deal with this English thing right like Shit, you can't speak, <laughs> you can't speak Spanish, shit. You know what I'm saying? You, I'm one up on you, right? So, so, and, and this is really what Ngugi is getting at, right? And, and that's what he talks about, that, that fatalistic logic. This is, that's exactly what he's, why can't more African writers think like Claudia, right? This is, this is exactly Ngugi's argument. It's exactly the point he's trying to drive home. Right. Um, so thank you, Claudia. That was a, a very um, brilliant point. Thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that with us because it's important. Um, also curious, Claudia, the teacher who said that was so frustrated with you. I'm just curious as to her ethnic background. Uh, she was white. <laughs> I, <had> a, <laughs> so, but I was I was born here. So I was born here and I went up to like I went to like private school and then I went to Mexico and I lived there for a while. So then I was, since I was very young learning English and I had to learn English again. So I learned it like a couple times because my first language was Spanish and then I moved and I started going to pre-K and then I learned it there in kindergarten. And then I went to Mexico. I, I completely ignored English because my focus was on learning Spanish, like being fluent and being able to read and write. So when I came back, I was fluent in Spanish, but I wasn't, I, I didn't have the same understanding in English as I did before. So um, my, all I could really do is just understand it, but I couldn't really read or write anymore. 
Um, so to shift the conversation a little bit, right? So this idea, because so so far the um, the distinction has been, you know, English juxtaposed to Spanish, and English has really been positioned in our conversation as like the colonial language, right? And Googie's positioning as um, English as the colonial language, which it is. There, there's no disagreement with that. There's no arguing that. But also on the table, right, is this notion of Spanish being a colonial language, right? What, what's your guys' thoughts on that? Why would I say that Spanish is a colonial language? Because like prior to like Spaniard colonization, we didn't speak Spanish. Right. We spoke whatever language our tribes or our native people spoke. I don't even know like what I am. Apparently like a grandfather of mine was like an actual like person in a tribe, but as far as I know, I know nothing. Yeah. And I know, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, just like a little, I guess piggy bank from what she was saying is, uh, I guess uh, um, different um, different cultures or different parts of talking Spanish. It's there's different languages even within like uh, Spanish, and there's different ways to talk it. Like uh, like me personally, I'm from Guatemala, so I'm a Guatemala's Mayans. So like the the language they talk like way before like thousands of years ago is not the same. Obviously, it's not the same language as not the same Spanish that is now. Like the Mayans talk differently than the Aztecs, like which is magical. So and so that's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good and it kind of piggybacks on Claudia's point also in the sense where she brought up the dialects, right? Like how you could kind of shift these colonial languages by altering the dialects, you know, and that's why you have so varying um, depictions and this varying um, lexicons of, of Spanish, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, but yeah, Angelica's absolutely right, right? Um, the Spanish language was violently imposed upon indigenous people. And it, it was a violent imposition, right? It, it wasn't something to where they, they treated, they taught it to you kindly and, you know, nah, that they, they brutally beat this language into you. Um, I believe I mentioned in this class, and I'll, I'll mention again, the three vestiges of colonialization and enslavement, right? Your name, your language, right? Your language and your religion. And Spanish is no different, you know. Um, and, and I think another thing that Angelica brought up is the fact that, you know we don't even know what that indigenous language was, right? Like, for at least for Ngugi, he could say I had my native Kikuyu language, which I still know and I could still write in and I could still speak in, right? To Angelica's point, she doesn't even know what that other language is, right? I I can't even trace back my people's lineage to know where that they're from to say what language they would speak, right? So when you talk about um, people take for granted how deep the impacts of colonialism was, right? The fact that Angelica says, I don't even know what that language would be, that shows you how deep colonialism has affected our daily reality, right? And, and, and the passage that Ngugi says, right? A person's language, the language that they choose defines them, right? So if, if that is true, then we are defining ourselves, me included, as I speak English, right? As a colonial subject, right? So we talk about home of the free and all these things, all these beautiful colloquialisms, right? We're not even free to speak or even free to know the language that we originally speak as native people to this land, right? To y'all land, the land that you originally occupied, right? I'm so severed from my connection to my um, heritage. I don't even know where to begin to look. At best, I could pay a government, a government entity, um, ancestry.com, $100 so they can tell me where I was stolen from, right? That's how, that's how good capitalism would do you, right? They'll steal you and say, here, bring me $100 and I'll tell you where you come from, right? This is, this is the, how thorough of a job colonialism has been able to do on the way that we understand ourselves, right? So that's the project that Ngugi is engaging in. Um, let's see. Let me show you guys, actually, before I do that, um, I'm going to show you what's next week's reading but i did want to ask has anybody made any progress on the homework that was assigned from last week's course discussion 
One, does anybody remember the homework that was assigned from last week's course discussion? No. Nah. Was it was it about like the purpose? Yeah, find your purpose. Okay, then yeah, I I think that made some progress. I mm -hmm. think I just like kind of misunderstood mm -hmm. what you're trying to get at. But thinking about it, well, after the meeting, I thought about it, and for me, like they were mentioning it too last week, that it's helping children because for me, what I want to become at least now is a social worker, and I want to become a social worker to help children. Um. Yeah, specifically children who are placed in a in a um, home where they're mistreated or abused. And I guess that to me is my purpose to help children. Right. Uh, that's how I see my purpose. So for, for those who don't remember, this is um, not only your homework, but what I would say is your life work, right? Um, find your purpose. And once you find your purpose, work ceasingly at fulfilling your purpose, right? And um, will you get a grade on it? I'm not gonna give you a grade on that, but if you think about it, what greater reward than having your life's purpose fulfilled, right? That's, that's so much bigger than a grade, right? That, that gives you purpose for life, right? That makes you wake up in the morning and feeling invigorated by what you have to do on a daily basis. So again, the homework or the life work is to find your purpose. And once you find and located that purpose to work ceasingly at fulfilling that purpose. Does everybody understand that? Does that make sense? Define our purpose. Yeah, and, and, and your purpose isn't to get a good job, right? Um, to have a lot of money, right? That's a profession. Your job is your profession. Your purpose, think about last week's reading, right? Think about Maladoma, what his name meant, how his name signified his purpose, right? Your purpose, what you were placed on this planet is so much bigger than money, right? You were brought here for a reason. Out of all the sperm cells that could have landed, you made it, right? That's for a reason, right? Your mom met your dad, however that came to y'all, came, they came together for you to be here, that's a reason, right? So from the Dagara purpose, from the Dagara standpoint, they said that happened for you to fulfill your purpose. So now you need to find out what your purpose is, right? Yes, I wanna be a professor. Yes, professors can make a lot of money, but my purpose is to educate people. Right. My purpose is for them to be able to see the divinity within them. Right. So, yeah, if, if I do it well, I can make money, but that's not what motivates me. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to help y'all find your purpose. Right. So that's the difference I want to draw between just getting a good job, being your purpose and how you can affect the world. Right. Your purpose can allow you to change the world and make the world better. Right. Money, it can allow you to do that, but you fulfilling your purpose will no doubt do that um so that's what i talk about what I, so that's what i mean when i say the homework um let me show you your your readings for next week give me one moment Time is moving, man. I can't. All right. Um, we're here already. Let me see something. One second, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, shit. Okay. Um, read Hurston Mules of Men. We'll do this next. Um, so one thing with this text, the reading, I'm sorry, the um the way she wrote it is, is very different. So I'll explain it to you this way. Um, I said that for the black folks in the room, we bilingual too, you have the Ebonics type of lexicon speaking and then the standard English. This that you're gonna read next week is written in all Ebonics, right? She's, these are um, folklores and stories that she captured from first hand accounts from her time in Florida in the early uh, like 1920s. Um, the author is Zornel Hurston. So um, be, keep that in mind when you read it. It's, it's like what they call like the old pigeon tongue uh, um so it's going to sound kind of weird 
but just try to read it out loud and work your way through it. Reading out loud will help. It'll help it make a lot more sense. Um, are there any questions you guys have for me? All right. 